Guys, so thanks for tuning in to this new episode of Get Tilted, 100% Tilted Discussions with Winning Underdogs. I'm your host, Michael David. Sitting to my left, if you're listening, is CEO Anthony Milton. And in the studios, we have a very special guest, a guest that you're going to recognize the name, but you may not know the story. Uh, retired U.S. Navy SEAL, fifth generation Texan. So you can definitely say he's from Texas. Yeah, there you go. Retired U.S. Navy SEAL, two deployments overseas, no, two different fronts. That's just that's the only ones I talk about. There's been, <laughs> there, there, are, there are a few more. I did, I did multiple, but <laughs> I fought in two wars. The story that a lot of people may not know about our guest today is during his time as a U.S. Navy SEAL, was also involved in a, a pretty horrible Black Hawk crash during a training exercise doing uh, fast roping onto a floating vessel. And that broke his back in six places. Uh, also uh, survived a, a traumatic brain injury that left him in a body cast. But through that, also recovering, went back out and continued his time as one of the, the highest trained operative that the military could actually produce. As a husband, as a father, as a businessman, who also got his uh, advanced degree in neuroscience. Neuroscience. Applied cognition. And with a bachelor's in psychology from the uh, Sam Houston State yep. University here in Texas. And is now decided to continue to serve our country and has, with the blessing of his wife and boys and family, uh, is going to put his hat in the ring to serve us in the 8th District of Texas. This guest is none other than Mr. Morgan Luttrell. Thank you for having me. That was Mor quite an eloquent introduction. Morgan, it's a real honor <laughs> to have you here. No, I, I mean, I love you guys. We, we've, uh, uh, we, we've started a friendship quite a while ago, and it's, yeah. it's good to always circle back and find you guys. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on the show. So there's a lot in that intro. <laughs> yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot to peel back there. There is. Um, now, being a fifth-generation Texan, uh, there's also a lineage of veterans. Mm -hmm. Majority of the males and, and, and females in, my, in, my, in our family served in, in some capacity or another in different branches of the military. And we've, we've been a part of ma every major engagement mm -hmm. all the way back to before anybody really got here. Mm -hmm. So military service was something that my brother and I were always aspiring to. The SEAL thing really didn't come about until we were in our early teens, nobody knew what a seal was. Nobody talked about it. There, there was, there may be a book or two somewhere, but we didn't have them. My father talked about uh, frogman, but we didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. And then there was a Discovery Channel special called The Silent Option. Had that guy with that awesome voice narrating, <laughs> narrating, had video of what <laughs> Navy SEALs did. They made the hair on the back of your neck stand up. We're like that's it right there that's what we're gonna do and we said it and we nobody from our hometown had ever done that nobody had ever heard of it nobody in our family had ever done it we didn't have the dna we didn't have the name right now id this is willis texas right willis willis texas yeah so we weren't athletes per se we could i mean we were athletic but we just weren't athletes we we're not a collegiate level athlete olympic level, none of that real kind of feeble small we didn't really start filling out growing our own until we were into college. So there was a bunch of naysayers out there, I guess is what I'm trying to get to. <laughs> but we would not be denied. And Marcus ended up leaving, getting out of college before I did. I actually broke my leg, my right leg. I damn near broke it off, sliding into second base. We were supposed, wow. to, we were supposed to go together. Yeah, it was a bad deal. And I sliding into second base, I cleaned the bag and, I mean, I felt, you, I mean, the, the, the break was so loud, the second baseman threw up. I mean, I broke every bone in my foot, destroyed my ankle joint, and it was a tib-fib fracture. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. So. You were a fast runner. Yeah, well, I was really good, buddy. I, I, if I need to get somewhere, I can go for a big guy. <laughs> and I didn't have any money in college. I was broke, dead broke. I mean, I mean I've, I've been homeless before. I tell people, I've been homeless before. I've, been, I've slept in my truck, slept on the ground, slept at a friend's house, didn't have any money. I had to go borrow two pieces of bread from two different people to get a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You know, like, I'm sure mm -hmm. like you guys. I mean, it's just part of part of growing up. I didn't have any money to fix my leg. They took me to the emergency room. They just splint it, sent me home. 
Wow. Yeah, because I had to have surgery. It was broken that bad. Well, the surgical center, that's a lot of money. Yeah. So I broke it on a Tuesday night. And Friday morning, a buddy of mine comes over to see me. And I, I, I was laying on my couch just looking back on it. it was, I guess pretty. You're not gonna laugh about it now, but I was. I'd have to crawl to the bathroom, and and fall into the tub and go to the bathroom with myself, rinse myself off, then crawl back to the couch because I couldn't stand up, and my leg was still broke. Anyway, a buddy of mine walked in. He's like, "What is happening here?" And I was like, "I don't have any money to pay for surgery." And he stroked a anesthesiologist wanted seven hundred bucks. The other doctor comped it, so he stroked me a check. Jason Miller, never forget. Oh. It. Yeah, so I had the first surgery. I had to have three. I ended up having three surgeries on that daggone thing, and uh, two years of rehab. And then I actually finally went in. But they kicked me out of the Navy. They were like, "You can't go in with that hardware in your leg." And the second year after I broke it, I flew out to see Marcus because he was in SEAL training, and he introduced me to the, the doctor out there. And I I did an interview in front of the doc, and he gave me a physical, and he signed a waiver, so I was able to come back in. I was like, "If you let me in back in, I swear I'll, I'll, I'll I won't let you down. I won't quit." He was like, yeah, okay, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Now, if if memory serves, isn't there kind of a funny story? Because for those that don't know with Morgan, and he's referenced his brother, Mark, this is twin brother. Um, people that know Mark's story from the, the book and the movie Lone Survivor. Mm-hmm. But isn't there, didn't you guys swap? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we, we did. I mean, we did the whole twin thing. We were identical. The older we get, you know, we're willing to, we're closer to 50 than we are 40 nowadays. But we were spitting image of each other in our youth and nobody knew there was two of us in the Navy. He didn't, oh, really? he didn't tell anybody, you know, maybe his roommate, his roommate knew, but it's not, you just, you know, you're so front sight focused on getting through that training. You don't have any time to share, share, share your life stories until, because there people just go away. Uh-huh. You know, people are quitting left and right. So you don't really get to know anybody. So that's mm-hmm. just some of the things you kept to yourself. Anyway, I went out to visit him one day. I was still in college and long, I mean, long story short, I guess, but, uh, he was running late. His roommate's like, hey, look, because he, he had uh, actually had, had a broken femur after Hell Week, and he was kind of dragging ass. Can we cuss? I apologize. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're, you're fine. Um, <laughs> he, was, he was dragging ass. And his roommate's like, oh, man, if, you, if, you, if you're having that bad of a day, why don't you just get your brother to go for you? <laughs> and, I mean, I looked at him. He looked at me. It would, I mean, it, it happened that fast. Literally, there was no planning. <laughs> it was just spontaneous. And I threw that uniform on and went out and did a, and did a day of buds. And you fast forward the tape, they found out. <laughs> Not right then, but they ended up finding out. So nobody even nobody could even tell the difference. Well, so his boat crew, they knew. <laughs> you know, okay, they had to watch after me because they were like, hey, his roommate was like, hey, because Marcus is tall. That is than, nuts. Yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> you know, when it happened, I didn't. It was just something, that, you know, hey, me and Mark are switching again. We've, we've done that our whole lives in school and whatnot. But looking back, here you are in SEAL training in, inside Naval Special Warfare, like a super top secret classified machine. And I'm, I'm standing there with no idea what to do. Never, you know, never been in the Navy, don't have any, <laughs> no, none of that. So his boat crew... They knew, and they were coaching me through what to do. And I was in shape. You know, I could I could handle it. And they were after Hell Week, right after Hell Week. So they were beat to hell. But, you know, when that came out, Marcus had gotten rolled out of his original class because of his injury and picked back up. And once that cer- that story started to circulate, uh, he was told to keep it a secret. And he did up until the day before he graduated, which then it, it had to come out. And... He had to go all the way up to the top to the man. He actually had an admiral's mask, and they were asking him, Tina, we want to know the whole story. Tell us every second of every single detail. And he did. And they let him graduate, and, you know, thank God they did, you know, because his story came out, and, he, you know, he's a hell of a SEAL. But when I showed up, they were waiting. <laughs> every one of them. And I didn't appreciate the gravity of doing something like that, you know. If I'd have quit, if I'd have gotten injured, I was a civilian. Inside naval special warfare, if you know, I think it's, it's, they they do it. They do it as an espionage training scenario now. Hey, what happens if a doppelganger come in here? Mm. What do you do? Because of you guys? Because of us? <laughs> yeah. And there was a, there was five, when we graduated. When I graduated, there was five sets of twins that ever made it through. Five brothers, five identical twin brothers, and we were. I, I don't know if more have gone through. 
but at the time we were the number five. So then, you know, so that was a big deal. And when I showed up and they were, <laughs> all of his instructors were there. CEO was still there. And buddy, I, I paid the man every single day, which is great. You know, I deserved it. I, you know, we got caught. You're gonna, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. If you get caught, you're going to pay the man. You're going to be dumb. Mm. You're going to be stupid. You better be hard. Mm. And I, you know, I, I was a pretty tough son of a bitch. So <laughs> not trying to toot my own horn, but I was, I'm pretty, you know, I, I grew up in the country. <laughs> I'm a pretty tough son of a bitch. And they made me earn every second of every every day to get my trident. But I did. Okay. Graduated top of my class. You know, that it was just all fun games. And towards the end, they were like, hey, you know, that's a great story. You know, mm. good job. You, you, that's what it's all about here. Mm. But uh, going through it, I damn sure didn't seem like it. So, yeah, Gr- we switched. Growing up, I uh, said, so with your dad being a veteran, did you grow up in a really militant type disciplinary home? Dad was a, he was a, kind of a different breed of human being. I won't bag him old man too much because he's dead, but. You know, he, he leaned on that Vietnam experience and, and his military experience when he raised us. I mean, he, we were, yes, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. You know, we, we very, very respectful, very, very driven. You know, he, he demanded that. I think his delivery was a little bit rough around the edges. He wasn't scared to get in the bottom of a bottle. Mm. To, you know, mm-hmm. he, that's, that's where he lived most mm-hmm. of the time. So well, you guys appreciate where I'm going with that. Yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't take anything away from him. We never, we always had a roof over our head and a, a meal in front of us. He did do that, and he loved us more than anything. But you know, I don't. Old Jack Daniels made him a son of a bitch majority of the time. But mm. so when that happened, you know, there were times he blamed the war on some of the shit he did to me and my brother. Mm. You know, I don't do that to my kids, but yeah, it was there. Mm-hmm. Were you and Marcus ever on the same team? Oh well, yeah. I said, well, that's see, yeah, and that's another thing too that most people we don't advertise that because a lot of people think that this, the thing called the Sullivan Act for for the listeners out there that, that don't know what the Sullivan Act is in the military in World War II, I think it was either on a ship or a submarine, one or the other. Five brothers, Sullivan brothers, were all killed at the same time, and it wiped the whole family out. And we were under the impression that the Sullivan Act would prevent Marks and I from being on the same team, the same platoon and deploy together mm. we thought that was a thing and after red wing happened we were at seal team five together and as we were deploying out we, we had to make a special request through our commanding officer who went all the way up to the to the top and requested that we be at the same team and deploy this together we just were not allowed the only stipulation was we were not allowed to ride in us in the same helicopter or ride the same humvee mm. same truck mm-hmm. just in case and then we were over <clears> ramadi <throat> Iraq in six and seven when it was that was the that was bad yeah I mean it was amazing amazingly bad awesome I mean we <laughs> were getting it done that was a big that's deal. what we're trained for yeah that was I mean we were putting foot to ass for country and utilizing our skills so you know we check in with our mom about once a month on Sunday call her right you know after she got back from church they get mom we're doing good she's like where are you boys is like, oh we're training in San Diego it's all good she's like, oh, okay just make sure you boys aren't you know in some place called the Ann bar or something rather it's like no mom we're not there that's where exactly where we were <laughs> so that was the only thing yeah so we were five together we were well our first command together we were stationed together we slept in one bedroom apartment that same bed mm. he was in a, diff- a different platoon than me so when he was deployed, I was home. When I was deployed, he was home. As a matter of fact, I was in Afghanistan, and they flew into country, and we slapped high five on the tarmac. And right after that, shortly after that's when Red Wing happened. Wow. Yeah. I, I, my platoon and I were already out there. And he came out and relieved us. And wow. So when we, yeah, like I came home, and I was in, I was in um, Army Freefall School out in Yuma, Arizona, when all, when all that went down. No kidding. Yeah. As a twin, and I've heard this, when all that was going on, of course you didn't know, could you feel something happen? No, so that's a great question. So uh, David Goggins and I were at Free Fall together. If you guys ever met David Goggins, if y'all haven't met David Goggins yet, he's, a, he, he's somebody y'all you can hear chat with. He's something else. <laughs> He, can't, he had gone into town. There, Yuma Free Fall Zone is way, well, it used to be way out in no cell, so, mm-hmm. cell service or anything like that. So I was out there, and David had gone into town and saw the news and heard about this crash and that something was going on and, and seal, something with the SEAL teams in Afghanistan. He came back out, and I saw him that morning, and he's like, hey, hey, bro, uh, some SEALs, looks like some SEALs got killed in Afghanistan. How's your brother? And I, 
You know, he said that to me. I looked square in the face. I was like, you know what? I don't feel nothing. He's fine. Exactly what I said to him. Hmm. And he's like, okay. So day goes by. The next day, it's out. You know, this is our guys. And my the couple of SEALs that were out in Yuma with me, like, hey, you sure nothing's going on? And I was like, no, nah, I'm sure, man. I don't feel nothing. I'm good. And I just started driving back into San Diego because I was – Finished. We had graduated, and I was headed back to San Diego to get on a plane to go to Hawaii, and my phone started pinging. And my first voicemail was a teammate of mine. He's like, hey, hang up right now and call me. So I did, and he was like, hey, man, yeah, it was y'all. It was, it was, it was us. It was, it was your brother's platoon. And I was like, well, all right, what, what are we looking at here? And he's, he, by that time, they, um, I think they knew Danny was dead. Mm-hmm. And they told uh, Matt, I think they knew Danny and Murphy were down in Max and Marcus, or MIA presumed KIA, is what he told me. He didn't know it, it's just what he told me. And that's a two and a half hour drive from Yuma, Arizona, San Diego. I mean, I, that, was rough, that was a rough go. I remember that one, that was, that was challenging. Anyway, so I was making my way to San Diego. But I knew, I knew, I knew in my heart and soul, I, I never believed my brother was dead. I knew that. Mm. And everybody was like, hey, you know, you pray. especially as it started to move downstream a little bit, and there was like four, day three, four, or five. I was like, hey, look, you know, you guys, y'all can talk, y'all can say all you want. I'm just like, man, y'all, y'all turn me loose and I'll go find him, or y'all find him. I know he's out there. I know he's hurt. I know he's, he's, he's in a bad way, but he's alive. And day, I hadn't thought about this in a while. I think it was day five, maybe, we got the call that he was rescued. Mm hmm. We had a stew, uh, secured line brought out. Navy put a secured line, red line, at our home. Which, um, of course, some country red, country folk rednecks I grew up with thought that was the coolest shit they'd ever seen. <laughs> it's like, that's a classified phone, like a presidential phone? I'm like, yeah, man, that's red, you know, red, red all over it. And like, who can we call? I was like, don't call anybody on that thing. But anyway, twice a day we were getting, uh, in the mornings, we'd get an update. It rise and fall of the sun, right? So we get an update in the morning, we get an update in the afternoon. Man, it got to where that was just exhausting. You just you get an update and then no no changes, mm. and you're just like, because the only people that, it was in my dad's bedroom, so the only people that were allowed in there was the, the seals because we had clearance. They, I mean, it literally turned it into a, a um, skiff, skiff, a classified area where you could have a phone like that. Mm. I mean, we had to have a watch on it and all that kind of it's kind of got out mm. of hand, but anyhow, and that that last day. By that time, there was about 60 team guys out there. And at any given time, there was 150 to 300 people on our property that never left. Wow. I mean, the whole county turned wow. out. It was, a, it was a sight. I mean, they were barbecuing, breakfast, lunch, din- cooking breakfast, lunch, dinner, barbecues. They brought outhouses out there, the sheriff and the constables and state troopers locked down. The roads getting to us. and That's amazing community support. Oh, buddy. I mean, we, we had church out wow. there on the grounds. I mean, wow. it, it was it was a it was a it was exhausting, but it was amazing. Because we, after the days, we you know we get a call. Hey, we found Danny's body. Hey, we found Mer's body. Hey, they recovered the helicopter. Gut wrenching, but then relief. Like it's a yeah. It's almost to a point. Like I don't, you know, just don't. I don't want anything until we find out what. Mm-hmm. Do, no more updates. And that, that day four or five, whichever one it was, we uh, we uh, all the team guys would walk into this room and I'm uh, and. Master Chief Gothrow was the one that would answer the phone. That was his thing. And uh, he got on that phone, I think it was in the afternoon, if I remember correctly. And he's like, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And we're kind of all standing there. He's like, yes, sir, understood, understood. And he dropped his head. And he dropped his head in a you know, quick, like an emotional, damn, one of them things. And everybody lost it. And I'm standing there, I'm just standing there looking at him, kind of stoic, just kind of there watching him because he's like, nah, I, I'm not feeling this. And uh, so everybody's like really getting in that emotional release, and man, he he gives a thumbs up to to us. Nobody sees that but me. And every because everybody out here comes mom and dad. Man, they're just crying their eyes. I mean, and then it then it starts to spread out to outside because mm-hmm. we didn't catch it in time. And everybody th- you know everybody's like, hey, you know, he's dead. They found him. He's dead. And the other. So we had to walk that back and um, tell everybody that they had found him. Which my family and friends and you know God bless them they they were all celebrating Marcus's you know he's, he's alive but we still had a man down 
we were missing somebody. We were missing Axe. And Axe and I were best friends. Um, he, we wow, were, no kidding, Morgan. Well, we were swim wow. buddies and buds. Yeah, we were swim buddy and dive buddy and buds. And then we were in uh, SDV school, pilot navigator together. And then he was my s- sniper partner. And we shooter spotter together. So we did everything together. Oh. Yeah. I mean, every, I'm day one, everything. So that was a. So the rest of the SEALs were just, you know, we. Your brother we, survived, but then you had a brother that didn't. Yeah. Right. So we're still waiting. And, and then, you know, inevitably they found him, found his body. Um, I think two weeks later, maybe. I think it was like day 14. You anyway, know, I don't know where. where um, oh, yeah. The question you asked me is if I. Yeah, I always knew my brother was alive. Mm. Sorry, I went down a little tangent on that. No, one. no, no. no. <laughs> yeah. So how long after, because uh, when Marcus came back and, you know, he was just getting taken care of, getting minted back up, uh, when you ended up doing uh, that exercise in, in the Black Hawk? That was a, well, so Marcus, he, he, Marcus got home about a month and a half later after he was rescued. He had to go to Germany, do debriefs and all that kind of stuff, and kind of rehabilitate and, they actually snuck him out of Germany. There's a there's a senator, <laughs> and I won't say say their name, but there was a senator in Germany that had was on, had his own plane, and Marcus jumped on it <laughs> and came home. Wow! Yeah, we picked him up in San Antonio, and then um, we were at home for about a month after that. Went back to and I feel bad about this because I I was ready to go back. I wanted to go back to work, mm-hmm. and I actually forced Marcus to do that. I was like, man, let's go. He's like, no, nah, I'm just not ready. I was like, yeah, it'll be good to get back in the team. Mm. You know, we'll work, we'll get back in the, get back in the grind, get back in the train, be great. And you know, he he he's like, okay, and that, you know, he shouldn't. I, sh- you know, I feel bad about. It. I shouldn't have done that to him, because um, it was not a good good. It didn't turn out to be a not not a good idea. You know, he wasn't ready. Excuse me. So from that day, after Red Wings, when we went back to Ramadi together. Wow. Yeah, so he got back from from wow. Afghanistan with all that that happened to him. And then we, we left Hawaii, went to C- Team 5, and then went to Ramadi. And then in, we left Ramadi, came home, and he retired. And I went out to the East Coast. I, I, I became an officer, commissioned officer, and I went to the East Coast of Team 8. Did a platoon out there, cycled back, and then in my second platoon at SEAL Team 8, is when the helicopter crashed. November November twenty November ninth, twenty I used to be good at this. Two thousand and nine, I think. Mm-hmm. I think that's when it was. Uh under yep, yeah, we were we were like you said, we were doing fast roping operations off the coast of Virginia. There was an underway vessel. It's really and when an epic storm Norwegians are blowing in, it was really kicking our ass anyway. Our, our, we were flying with the one sixtieth. Soar, I mean, arguably the greatest rotor wing asset the world's ever known. Still to this day, I mean, those guys are the, the absolute, guys and girls are the absolute best at what they do. That was just a series of misfortune events. The helicopter lost, was uh, lost some altitude, and the ship was, you know, sh- the ship mm-hmm. was rising and falling, and the rotor struck the plenums, the stacks on the boat, sheared them off, and the helicopter ended up turning on its side, and those of us in it fell out, and the helicopter crashed on top of us, caught on fire, blew up. Killed the killed the crew chief and it was catastrophic loss to the rest of us and I, and I broke my back and I actually broke I landed in a you know the <laughs> the worst part about it is I landed in a seated position from about forty feet and I was completely wow. I was kitted up and I walk around six well I used to be six four I'm about six two and some change these days but at any given time I was around three eighteen to three twenty with all my kit on wow and so imagine jumping off a four story building land on your butt God. shit hurt. It hurt bad. I felt yeah. it too. I didn't know where I was when it happened. You know, you see the movies, the bells and whistles, and if you've seen like Black Hawk Down and some of the uh, military movies that have helicopter crashes, you don't walk away from these things. It's just you just don't. And ours happened so fast. I mean, the rotors were sheared off in a heartbeat. And I just remember hearing all. The, I was looking out from underneath the the structure of the helicopter because I was go, I was fixing to get on the rope. I was the last one out because I'm the officer. The guys go down first and do all the shoot, move, and communicate. And I, as the officer, I come down and I just do, you know, officer stuff. <laughs> that doesn't sound sexy at all, but whatever. <laughs> and I remember seeing the the static electric glow on the end of the rotor blades because we were so close to that boat. Mm. And there was this beautiful blue circle around the helicopter. But you could not see the distance from the from the rotors to the ship. It was, it was like fractions of an inch. 
Wow. Yeah. And I remember I was talking to my buddy too, and he said the same thing. Like months, months later, we were talking about it. And I was like, he's like, I remember seeing that glow. And I was like, do I do too? And I was like, man, these fuckers are good. <laughs> and the second I said that in my head, wow. Metal on metal, like somebody threw us in a blender. And then I, the next thing I remember, uh, I don't remember falling, which is kind of crazy, but I remember hitting. Mm. And the second I landed on my butt, I felt everything go. I mean, I felt my coccyx, my sacrum break. I felt my back go. Wow. Yeah, and I made that real <laughs> – the only thing I was concerned about is I made that real stupid noise you make when you get the breath knocked out of you. Um, <laughs> that's all I, I was concerned that my guys <laughs> heard me do that and they were going to make fun of me. <laughs> yeah, can you believe that? That's the only thing I kept thinking of. Anyway, so I ended up coming out of the helicopter and I fell off the next deck and I landed on my head. And that's how I got my head injury. But that's all good, man. It's just another day. It was a bad day at the office. It was tragic. We lost the crew chief. They were, they were, he was an amazing guy. And um, I was the least injured out of everybody. The other guys that were in the helicopter with me were just torn up bad. But we all made the deployment. We all fit, you know, neck down, we got it. We can fix just about anything. Put anything on you. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have arms and hands just yet, but feet, legs, lungs, ankle, heart, kidneys. I mean, we can put that back together pretty well. So we went, we went, I was in, I was in a body cast for better part of almost half a year, better part of a year. Went down to Florida to a, a place called athletes performance at the Andrews Institute. And they put me back together. I came out of that cast and I never looked back. It was the head injury. That was the try that the, the challenging part of mm -hmm. everything that I didn't know that at the time. I mean, I was a pipe hitting team guy. I didn't know anything about the brain. Mm -hmm. But you went back out, didn't you? Twice, after all that? yeah, twice. Went back to went back to Iraq on that and with that platoon, and then um, back to Afghanistan in 2012. I think is when it was. Worst end, uh, and to this day, uh, the greatest the greatest thing about being a, a officer is your platoon commander deployment when you're in, you're in charge. You know, we were up in the mountains. I had my own platoon, my my own vs my own site. I ran it, and we came out of the mountains and went back down to the rear. And I told him I, we were leaving to go back to our house. And I told my chief, I was like, hey, I'm going to run by medical real quick and get something for my legs. Because that night, my legs were just it was excruciating. They, was, they were still trying to run, and I was trying to go to bed. And it just ached, and it was horrible. And I walked in and said, hey, doc, man, I, you got anything for, I don't know what I got going on, but my legs are killing me. He starts asking me some probing questions. And uh, he's like, you ever had a spinal cord injury? And I was like, mm. I have. And 30 minutes later, I was on a bird out of there. Wow. And my career was over right then. Mm. Yeah, it was terrible, tragic. Now, you you are you got a bachelor's in psychology. Yep. <clears throat> and then you took that, you got an advanced degree in neuroscience yes, at yep. um, University of Texas. Yep, UT Dallas. Um, first, what inspired you to even get a degree in psychology? What was that spark that then led to this? No math and all women. <laughs> and fair. It's fair. God. <laughs> I mean, I was a CJ major, biology major, chemistry major, kinesiology major. I ran, I mean, I just, I, I, it took me six years to get out of undergrad. Mm. I just, I wasn't built for academia. It was certainly a social experiment for me. I, I paid my own way through school. Mm. Uh, I, I tell people that's where I cut my teeth and became a man, you know, mm. and learned how to learn how to not everything you know you got to earn what you want in psychology i say no math and all women i mean that's that's true i don't know if you have yeah, 20 20s you probably can't say that anymore but i'm gonna say it <laughs> but I, it, for whatever reason it, uh, human behavior piqued my interest mm. you know behavioral sciences piqued my interest I have, in my mind is in philosophy and I just always enjoyed the, the aspect. It's it's that unknown frontier. You're just, you're trying to pick apart, and everybody's specifically everybody's different. And I, believe it or not, that's that that degree in psychology really helped me in the military when we were we dealing with other people and watching mannerisms and characteristics and how to put that together. All the while knowing that I was going to be in the SEAL teams and never use a psychology degree. I had no intention of doing that. But after getting out of the military with it and going back to grad school for cognitive neuroscience it, it, it definitely it, it helped out tremendously i and i studied applied cognition and neuroscience because of my head injury 
I was trying mm. to fix myself. Mm. And the you know the, the brain is the last bastion of untouched frontier. It's it's that three to five pound gelatinous substance between your ears that allows us to contemplate thought, contemplate the contemplation of thought, allows me to sit here and talk to you, understand what I'm saying. You know, we put a man on the moon. We just, you know, we're drink, drink, I'm drinking a Topo Chico. Where'd that come from? You know, the brain is the mechanism that makes everything right up to the point where you talk, where, where, where you hit God, mm-hmm. you know, and then there it is. So, yeah, the brain is an amazing thing. And I was trying to find the tools to put my proverbial toolbox to help me get better. And that, that led... That's, that is why I got into neuroscience. Because, I again, I was not built for school. I mean, I'm, out, I'm an outside guy. But I wanted to fix myself. And I, and I struggled through so I struggled through school again. I mean, <laughs> I was not – I tell people, I graduated last on my class at Sam Houston State with that degree. I mean, the, the 2.0. I mean, like, my dean was like, get gone, get leave. Graduated. I did. I mean, that's the hardest thing I've ever done. That was, that, was, that was hard. Yeah, I got it. I mean, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. People bag on me all the time by getting a 2.0. I was like, that's the hardest thing I ever did. Mm. I mean, I busted my ass to get that 2.0. I mean, you can make fun of me all you want, but you're not going to outwork me. Mm. So I took that that work ethic and then what I learned in the military. And I graduated uh, magna cum laude out of UT in grad school. And I graduated with 3.9. Still statistics got me in <laughs> <laughs> math again. Ooh, anyway. But that's how I got back into grad school, surely just studying the brain because I just was having so much trouble with that head injury I had. I wanted to figure out how do I bring myself out of this hole I keep finding myself in. Uh, fascinating studies, and, I, and it's a passion of mine now even today. I think one of the things that compels most people when they, when they hear that somebody was a Navy SEAL was we all have this idea of it's the most generous, the hardest, the most grueling. And you, you came and you, you spoke at our uh, company summit a few weeks ago yeah, that was great. And, yeah. and you told this story that is just circled and it's gotten around. Uh, oh, okay. And it's interesting how good, good or bad. <laughs> good. It, it's interesting how you ended up in that pit when you were kind of in that same situation where you're in that tub mm-hmm. when you couldn't stand up straight Yeah, to go to the bathroom. Yeah. And as you're dealing with, with behavioral science and cognition and thought and decision-making, when you voluntarily go through the most grueling type of training to be the, most highly trained operative in the face of the planet. And you also end up suffering a horrible injury to go through rehab and then to go back out again where most people would tap out. You start to look at the resilience of somebody of where that ability to come to that fork in the road and then lean into what's hard again, when you could lean out and maybe pursue some, pursue something a little bit softer, less strenuous, less demanding, less risk. Uh, but yet you and your brother, both, you have this innate quality about you guys. You know, it's, and it's nothing that we were, we were again, we're not, we, we grew up on a horse ranch. I mean, nothing, we wouldn't, mm-hmm. wasn't something we were born with, something that we uh, maybe developed over time with those that we s- surrounded ourselves with. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I've always been in the mindset that it's not if, but when something's going to happen, especially in the military. And I say especially in the military, in life. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. When I walk out of here, I'm going to get hit by a truck, you know, you know. But you never let that define you, no matter the, the, the circumstance. And that story I told, you know, everybody is going to find themselves in that deep, dark black hole, and you're going to have to crawl out of it. Or you're just going to have to lay in there for the rest of your life. Well, why would you do that? Mm-hmm. And I always keep a, a, a mental attitude about myself because I don't have bad days anymore. Mark's not, you know, we talk about this quite a bit. I don't have bad days. I have character-building days. If something, if something happens to you that that you didn't expect, that's okay. You know, you got to learn from it. You got to keep moving forward. And when I say move forward, I, don't let that particular, whatever that circumstance was, define you. Mm-hmm. Educate yourself with it because it will happen again. Or somebody that is close to you will happen to them. And you now you have the ability to say, hey, look, you know, I went through that exact same thing. This is how I navigated those difficult waters. And if you're just going to, I just always appreciate life as just a, a, a series of unfortunate and unexpected events that good, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. And it's just, a, it's a chapter, it's a page, it's a sentence, a paragraph in my book, in my book of life. And that story I told about us in Hell Week, you know, I had to get in that hole in order to be a SEAL. I had to get down in that hole. Every, everybody that ever gone through there had to get down in that hole. And I got in there with all those other guys in there that want to be the exact same thing I was. And it's, it's relative experience. I mean, even, even in the business world, right, you come into work and you're just having that awful day that nothing is going right and you find yourself in that hole. 
no matter how far down there you go, you can always come out of it. And you can all, and all of us see somebody that's living in one of them holes. And we were having that discussion today. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd be surprised how, what, what affects, how, it, how effective someone that either you work, you like one of your employees, one of my employees or somebody above me, if they just reach down there for a half second, a minute to spend time with me and ask me what's going, how can I help? Or, Hey, let me pray with you or whatever, you know, how effective that can be. Mm. And yeah, take it in stride. We're either in one or about to get in one or just got out of one. Yeah. Life is a series of black holes. You're going to find yourself <laughs> in them no matter what. <laughs> don't be afraid. Don't, don't ever be afraid. Don't ever say, I'm not going to do something because it's going to be hard or I'm going to lose or I'm going to get hurt. Why would you do that? You, you do the, you're supposed to do the exact opposite. That's how you grow. But what you don't learn, you repeat until you do learn it, right? Well, if you ever <laughs> make, if you ever make the same mistake twice, you're not paying attention. You just don't care. And that's not the way to live oh, your life. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's dang. That couldn't be any more true. And, and I, I tell people that work with me, I tell people when I'm out on the campaign trail, I was like, look, I promise you one thing. I will make mistakes. I'm human. I'll never make the same mistake twice. Because if I do that, it means I'm not paying attention. I don't care. And it's my job to pay attention. So let's so talk. Let's, go ahead. The campaign trail, 8th District. Yeah. Was, there, was there a single catalyst that was the finality of you wanting to run, or was it a it's series my home. of events? It's my home. I mean, there, 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 is, there, there is a a series of things that lined up, but it, I grew up here. It is, it was, it's my home. And I have... I have I have either lived, gone to school, hunted or fished, and have family in every one of the counties in the district. And I speak the language. Mm-hmm. And if if you ask, well, are there any certainties in this? Like, yeah, that we're certain we have to have somebody represent this district. We do. There has to be a congressional member from District Eight. And I was of the mindset if somebody was going to knock on my door, I'd want them to walk up and say, "Hey, look, I was raised here. Mm. I, I see, I understand, and I know." what these farmers and ranchers want. And I know what these folks that live in the city want, you know, cause I've done both, you know, and I, I, I took something from the, the, <laughs> the Spartan community when the, the Persian empire was coming after him, you know, because in this game of politics, people have often asked me, is like, well, what if, are they going to take something away from you? Or what if they're going to, you know, what if they come after you, they try to hurt you. I was like, well, I have, I literally, and the person, the, the Spartans, like, I don't know why they would come after us because they can't, they can't out, they can't out fight our poverty. Mm-hmm. We're so poor. We've ha- we have literally nothing but our land and our pride, right? And I've I've been at the bottom. I've been in that black hole. You can't take anything away from me. I've been just as miserable and lonely than than anybody, you know, relative. So I'm not worried about how hard it is, how scary it is. All I care about is fighting and defending and representing everyone from here. And I mean, taking it right on the chin, bloody, it doesn't matter, 15 rounds. I, I love it. And I didn't have anybody come up to my door and knock, knock on my door and say that. And that's why, that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> the Spartan mentality, we don't have anything other than our land and our pride to fight for. Sounds kind of like a current world event that we were just talking about. You think? <laughs> There's little similarities there. Yeah. So Kevin Brady was in this seat for 25, 25 years. 25 years? Yeah. What are some of the things that you appreciate he, that he accomplished? So he, he passed the, um, uh, the most recent tax cut for the country, and he'd, he'd been fighting that guy. He'd been fighting that guy. It was the first time in, what, 30 years maybe? It's 80, I missed this, to 83, 86, I think, is when our last um, restructuring of the tax codes went through, and he, and he championed that guy. The whole time he was in ways and means mm-hmm. way. So I, you know, I was a little ignorant to the details of ways and means. I thought that was just a small business. We're working the tax code. But that's so that's, that's social security. That's Medicare. That's it. T- ways and means touches the human existence. And it, he did a, a lot of things. Most notably is the, the, the tax cuts for businesses and, and private citizens. Mm-hmm. He teed up one thing that most people don't know about. It's called the windfall exclusion act you guys ever heard of this mm-hmm. and it's for <clears throat> teachers it's for first response police police officers first responders and educators 
Okay. It's a bill that was passed. <clears throat> We're trying to get rid of it, and he's trying to get rid of it. But uh, maybe a decade ago, uh, a provision was passed, a law was passed that says if you were a firefighter, if you work a second job, because firefighters work 24 hours every two weeks or every week, right? You know, or like a police officer. Police officers, they do their jobs, but a lot of them work second jobs in order to make ends meet. If you work your second job, you only get a certain percentage when you, once you retire. You're paying into Social Security. You, know? you, only, you don't get your full benefit. You only get a portion of it. They're out. They're out almost nine hundred dollars a month because of it. Wow! So because they take care of their family today, they get penalized down the road. Right. And they, there are educators, our first responders, and our police officers. Can you believe that? Wow! That's, that's the most horrible thing I've ever heard. Because they don't get paid anyway, and they're the backbone of our entire district and country. Mm-hmm. You know, they're our educators of our children, mm-hmm. and it's just, it's, just, and I, they're, uh, they're really up, upset about that. And I want to make sure that that's something I, especially here and I did, they're really upset about that here. So flip side of that question, what are a couple of things that you hope to be able to accomplish that Kevin couldn't accomplish? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, our border is a big deal here. And when we talk about border, border security and immigration, immigration laws, that's a political wind that seems to ebb and flow with the changing of the administrations or the, or the House or the Senate. Um, we have never, and, and unfortunately, when there's a political hot button, like our border, like our um, economy, like our excessive spending, you know, those are some things that should never be out of control. Those are some things that should be, there should be that synergy that allows us to live in harmony. But unfortunately, they use those things as a political um, wedge and, a, and political leverage in order to get elected mm-hmm. and things that Kevin Brady what were not it's impossible to do thing anything by yourself in Congress I mean, be you know we know that let's be very clear it takes a majority vote to pass any regulation to get that thing across so I won't blame Congressman Brady for anything you know um, he's one part of the big team uh, if I was to point any fingers I'd be like hey look we, we, we as a team need to come together I'm a walk back regulation guy I mean, I think we got plenty of laws on the books right now. I think there's too many of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, I'm a, I'm a tech, medical, and energy independent guy, and I think we we in here in the country need to bring those three things back inside our borders because we're very dependent on everyone else around the the globe for those three things. Um, I mean, if you really look at it, medical independence, we we got to go to China to get our all of our ingredients for our medications mm-hmm. and our PPE. And we, we got a pandemic from China. I mean, that just doesn't seem right. It's not right. Uh, our energy independence, we have, we, I mean, here, even in Texas, we could supply the entire country for decades. Yeah. Right out of our own state. Matter of fact, we had a PPE company set up right across the street from us. Uh, Wildcat? Yeah, Wildcat. Sure did, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that place was humming like crazy there for a while. And um, tech. I'm a big tech guy, and we don't do any of that here. I mean, if Taiwan falls to China, we are in trouble, fellas. I mean, that's what caused the the chip shortage for all the vehicles. Still, still to this day, yeah. right now. Yeah. And with the with what's happening over on in Ukraine with Russia, China's watching. I'd be willing to bet they're, they're China President Xi is sitting there watching how far Putin's going to go and the reaction of NATO and the United States to see what they do with this action that's going on in Ukraine, and if it's minimal. China's going to take Taiwan. So one of the issues around, or one of the hot topics on regulation is also with subsidies. So it's kind of a government mindset that if you regulate an industry, then the government's job is to subsidize the industry to support the regulations. Mm -hmm. If you deregulate it, then the government should be free from subsidizing that industry because it's no longer the government's responsibility in large part. How would like, uh, let's take... Yeah, you got to give me one. <laughs> don't throw me to the wolves and say, which one? <laughs> well, you got to so give me one. I don't know the specifics about it, but there's conversations around uh, Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, cell phone towers, networks, fibers, 4G, 5G, so on and so forth. It was heavily yeah. subsidized by the government over the last couple of decades to build the infrastructure, um, while at the same time deregulating those entire industries mm-hmm. to where the costs of those to the consumer. 
we're through the roof. Yep. So there's that balance. <sighs> there is, and I think that's another one of those things when the the politicians and the lobbyists got in a bed together. Now us, the people, we the people are feeling that. Pay, pay for it. Yeah, paying for it. That's, mm. that's. I'll always be. You know, I, sometimes I say things that make people uncomfortable. It's like you ask a question, I'm gonna let you know right now. I mean, and that's just the case right there. We we are so dependent on that technology right now that's in our pockets, or we're sitting here in front of us on this computer screen, that it is the it is the bandwidth that which we communicate and we thrive and we live through business through so through business personal government. It happens. And since there's really no definable lane of how all of that works, yeah, they're going to come in. They're going to subsidize because the government needs it. But at the end of the day, we're the ones get penalized yeah. for it. So where's so where does it live, right? Should we, should, like you said, should we take away the subsidies and, and the regulations? We're like, well, okay, free market. I'm always about. A, I'm a free market guy. Hey man, you got to get in and compete for it, and you got to win. If you want it bad enough, you got to fight for it. And I've actually been beat up about that too, you know, because there's companies out there that just, they have become something that nobody ever saw. Google, Amazon, mm -hmm. Microsoft. I mean, those things live, face, Facebook, those things are so powerful. And my, my, and my response was like, hey, look, you know, if you don't like what you're seeing, change it. Create something. And I, I get beat up for that quite a bit. And, and, I, and, and the reason I say that is because I own a business. You guys own a business. You fought your asses off to start this business. How would you feel if somebody came in and slapped regulations on you? It's like, oh, you can't do that anymore. You know, I don't care how hard you worked. Like, I used, I used, um, have you ever seen that, that iconic image of um, um, Jeff Bezos when he's sitting in his office, like in his basement, it says Amazon, on Butcher yeah, Piper? Yeah, like hand and drawn. Broke, yeah. just broke. Yeah. But would not quit. And look what he has now. You know, I don't fault the guy for that at all. I'm not going to bag on him. And I'm not going to say, hey, look, you, you shouldn't have what you have. Because tonight when I get home and I need some dog food, I'm going to jump on it and get it. <laughs> Tomorrow. You know what I mean? Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, or maybe even tonight. <laughs> um, where, how, do you how, do you fix the, how do you fix that particular problem? I think I, you know, it's something that's, gonna, that's, a, that's a whiteboard think tank thing. I wish I had a, a perfect answer for you. I don't. We saw it through the pandemic. The state of Texas tried to overregulate our industry. Barbershops, haircuts. Yeah. Tell them when we can operate, how we can operate, if we can even open the doors. Threatened being arrested. Yeah. Remember how that head. felt? Yeah, it's terrible. And I, and I say, I mean, the less government that's living and breathing in anything is, is appropriate. I mean, our government was defined or, or created for... Very small thing. <coughs> Def defending our borders, which they don't do, coining money and and taxes, I understand, but I'm I mean, <laughs> that's gotten out of control too. And that's it. Not come down here and tell you when when and how you should operate. And that whole pandemic thing, man, I just when politics got into science. Mm -hmm. Politics got into research and it ruined it. The egos of a lot of politics, well, people in general, there's a lot of egos, right? Everybody's got an ego with how you manage it, how you control it, and how you funnel it is important. Colin Powell said it. Uh, I don't know if you read Colin Powell's book. It worked for me is what it's called. Uh, and one of his rules of life, he has 25 rules of life. And one of it was never let your ego get so close to your position that if your position fails, your ego does also. That's one of the things that happened, especially during the pandemic, was it became an ego. No one could be wrong. And there's two sides or three sides to an argument. And no one can accept a defeat or an accept changing their thought process. So we just, everybody dug their heels in. It's funny. Their position they couldn't say we were wrong. They were, side, they were tied yeah. so close together. Oh, hey, you know what? It's funny you should say that. I was having, a, I had something happen to me. I was, I was in charge. I was still in the military. And I could not figure out what was going on. I could not fix the problem. Mm. I couldn't, no matter who I was talking to, no matter what I tried, I could not fix the problem. And I walked in and looked in the fucking mirror, and it was staring me right back in the face. It was me. I was the problem. And I fixed it right there. That's, that Colin Powell rule is exactly what you're saying. And I dropped that ego, and it was, it was my ego. It was getting in the way. Because I got told to do something I didn't want to do. And I was just fighting it tongue-in-cheek, not seeing bigger picture. 
And I took a hard look in the mirror and I was like, there it is right there. Yeah. And fixed it. Right there. And it was great. And life was so much better after. I mean, I'm not saying I worked growing pain, but it just turned out to be such bliss after the fact I dropped all that horse shit and said, okay, you know what? Yeah, here, I, all right, I apologize. I came out, I apologize. It's my fault, my fault. I got this. <laughs> and I mean, I broke it all the way down to lowest common denominator. A single source, single point of failure was this guy right here. <laughs> I've learned more in my failures than I have in my successes. And that was one of them. Oh, man, that's, yeah. How many are running in the primary? There's 11 of us. Yeah. Today's the last day of early voting, and Tuesday's the, March 1st is the, this is a, this is a primary election in our district. It's, that's whoever takes that seat. Whoever takes primary is going. Is there a competitor from the other side? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is. This is uh, our district, Montgomery County, Walker County, San Jacinto, Polk counties, and our Northwest Harris County. It's the um, reddest district in the country. Mm-hmm. 70, Montgomery County, 78% Trump in 20? Yeah, I thought it was actually 80, like 81, but yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, that's it's a big deal around here. You know, from a personal level, and, you know, when you look at people that, that are running, they're coming from here, you're fifth generation from here, mm-hmm. but there's a unique quality, I think, about you that nobody else that's running can compare. This is not an ego thing, for uh, what I'm going to say to you. Morgan, because, uh, and this is what I think people need to understand. Uh, when you come from the SEALs, when you come from having to make decisions at a time where, and you're trained to, you're trained to make clear cognitive choices when you're in the most stressful environment possible, when everything goes to shit. And you've got to be able to remain clear. That's why, from what I've read and gathered, and in, in, I fan out with SEALs in mm-hmm. the videos, but it's always the training. And it's, it's, it's inducing stress, chaos, and battlefield uh, scenarios habitually over and over again, shooting over and over again, so that you can make clear, concise, sharp decisions in those moments. Mm-hmm. And that's what you have to do and what, about what you're going to have to face to do in, in Congress. Because in emotion, in narratives that are driven by lobbyists, by deep pockets, and people are throwing shade... To be able to have the ability to think clear and concise and big picture in those moments is what I think makes you way more equipped than anybody else. Oh, thank you. Yeah, f- always remember exactly what your role and responsibility is and who you represent will allow you to do great things in D.C. When you lose, when you think it's about you mm. and what you think is appropriate, then you've lost. That's why I'm not. That's why I'm a term limits guy. That's it. Three terms? I'm out. Yeah. Because after that? Come home and run my business, raise my babies. <laughs> I tell people three terms, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I used to say two, but the first one, you're trying to figure it out. Yeah. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And then I'm going <clears> to, <throat> like, you guys, I mean, it's tough going 15 rounds. Mm. You know? And that's, every day you're up there, you're in, you're in the ring. Mm. And after... <laughs> You can appreciate this. I mean, after you get beat on and beat on and beat on, you're like, all right, what do I got to do not to get beat on? Well, yeah. I can just kind of start to go along and get along. So my philosophy is I get up there and slug it out as hard as I can and then bring some, then tag somebody else in. Like, your turn. <laughs> but you've got to earn this. This isn't been, this isn't no, I mean, this campaign, this has been challenging. challenging. I mean, it's tough. People just, just talking all kinds of ugliness towards me, and I'm trying to be appropriate here, but you know, saying <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some things I say, I'm like, where could you eat? I mean, yeah, it's a bit much. Has it been hard on your family a little bit? Oh yeah, yeah. But it, we came in this together as a family. We made this. We knew we're like, hey, look, this 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 is not gonna be cool. It's not gonna mm-hmm. be cool at all. And the hard, and you know what the worst part about it? It's, it's Republicans that are doing it. I ain't even going on Democrat yet. <laughs> really. You know, wow. it's it's on the Republican side. They're just tearing my ass up. And, but, hey, you know, that's all right. And I'm a high ground guy. I have, n- I have never said one ill word about my opponents and never will. I never say anything. I praise in public and criticize in private. Mm-hmm. And if I got to take you to the woodshed, nobody's going to know about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so give me, let, me, let me walk through a large level of our team for a second and kind of their thought process collectively. Not singular, but collectively when it comes to kind of the Democrat, Republican, red, blue, so on and so forth. Yeah. 680 employees across 66 stores and three brands. The majority of them are younger in age, under 30. Um, 
heavy minority, heavy single moms. Mm-hmm. They can associate themselves with a lot of conservative values, uh, lower taxation, lower regulation, yep. strong military and defense. Uh, there's a lot of things they connect with, but there's never been that connection piece between that demographic base and the social family values of the conservative base. It seems to always be the disconnect. What do they say? Uh, uh, abortion is an example. Yeah. Uh, um, marriage, family, because it's going against what there is. So there seems to be this dividing line where it's young Democrats and old Republicans. I would say well, I'm, a, I'm not gap. an old Republican. I'm a young Republican. <laughs> yeah, old being like under 30. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right? okay so if we have... Uh, um, Barbers and hairstyles, they're trying to buy their first house. They're trying to buy their first car. They're trying to put their kid through preschool. Mm-hmm. They're living paycheck to paycheck or two paychecks at a time. Um, they have little debt and little desire to obtain debt. They're trying to go through the first tribulations of life. And a lot of the social aspects that conservatives typically don't like to do, government assistance, mm-hmm. welfare, WIC, um, housing, affordable housing, uh, um, uh, child tax credits, a lot of those things that typically are more liberal in mind yep. is what sets off a lot of people to what turns off a lot to of go people that, to go that way. Say, so I, that's one of those, another one of those things I usually don't back down after cause I had, I struggled. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I don't see, I'm not saying I don't feel for people that had struggle, but I, I struggled. Struggle is part of life. It's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. And when, and I'm not saying there's there's not there's not things out there that are appropriate for single moms that are that are still working two jobs and have three kids and they're just getting their butts handed to them. Yeah, there, there, there's those times things. My problem is when when those particular programs get put in place and they, they don't ever get walked back and they just keep adding to them, add to them, and then you just find <coughs> it's just an out of control spending spree that can never be walked back, and then it's then it's taken advantage of. An unmanageable. It's a, yeah. government dependency. And I mean, we are thirty trillion dollars in debt, mm-hmm. and the vast majority of that is on social programs. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and I'm not saying there's not that that doesn't need to be there, but what it's how it seems the, the lens at which I see it is today is they're just like absolutely going to give you everything. Don't even go to work. You know what? Don't you don't even have to. We got you. Mm-hmm. You know what? We'll pay for everything. We got to float the bill for that. Somebody's got to pay for it. And you hear him's like, well, let's, well, we could print our own money, so we don't have to worry about that. If you guys had the, were in the red, like our country is, they wouldn't put, they wouldn't put you out of business. They'd put you in jail. Mm-hmm. They would. And so it, 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 it all works in this synergistic system, right? And people, I try to say, hey, look, you need to take, you need to look at this thing as a big picture model here. Like, we can do as many social programs as we want and help you out, but your kids... There's not, they're not going to be in there there for them. But we can help you right now, but there's nothing, nothing's going to be there for them. Social security is not going to be there for your kids. It's not going to be there for my kids. It's on, it's going to go and solve it in 10 years mm-hmm. or faster than that. And th- that's why, and I'll, and I'll speak for this Republican me is why I'm against those, those programs and, the way, and how they are because it's, it's endless. And now p- politicians on, on the Democratic side are just using it for, hey, I'll give you $1,500 a month not to go to work if you just vote for me. <laughs> you know, you see how the economy lives right now. You see what inflation looks like. We, we can't spur We're trying to spur economic growth through excessive spending. Mm-hmm. The Federal Reserve is printing money hand over fist. That's why inflation is over skyrocket. It's almost hyperinflation. What comes after hyperinflation? A dramatic recession. I mean, it's just this up, and, and that's going to take about 10 years. <clears throat> you know, it as hard as it is to get up every morning and go out and work, you have to do that. You, 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 I, you can't sit there and just say, hey, look, give me everything I, I need and I want if you want to have your country for your kids. You can't do that. How do you influence citizens that are well off to become more of a job creator or more of a philanthropist or more of a helping the fellow man up so the government doesn't have to do it? We, we had the conversation today. It was about Social Security, how you solve Social Security. And we were talking to a, a gentleman that was very, very, very successful. And he's like, do you think I deserve my Social Security benefits when I retire? Like, no, you don't. And you've paid into it your entire life for 35 years. You don't, because you don't need it. And a, 
quite a few people I talk to that are successful. Like, I don't even want it. They just give it to me. So this, this, there needs to be a restructuring of the system itself for that to work. Um, after the question again, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to say that social security piece. You're running the social security piece 100%, but how do you get the average citizen, the job creator or the businessman or the millionaire, or the billionaire, or the oh, Jeff to Bezos, create jobs? To say, I, let me help my fellow man more so the government doesn't have to. Let me relieve the burden oh, of the government. Oh, yeah, my human nature. <laughs> more of a citizen <laughs> statesman. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's in, I mean, I don't even take a salary out of my company. I give it to my employees. Because it's selfish end of it. You know, and so the average person is looking at Jeff Bezos. Like why do you need? Penis-shaped rocket. And saying, why like, you, eh, Why do you need $100 billion? Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, I, I, you know, so you much know, more use. I understand. Um, and, that, you know, there's human nature. And if you can define human nature, you'll, you, you've solved it. You know, and it's. How much is enough is what you're asking. Mm -hmm. You know, do I need, do I need trillions of dollars? I mean, I don't, but you know, maybe some people do. If you just, could you imagine what kind of distribution or if you were to hire so many people that you could pay a hundred thousand dollars a year off of a, that, that amount of money that, 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 that particular company takes in. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. But I'm not going to let, every, I'm not going to let people off, the, off the, off the hook here. Are there actually going to be people to show up to do it? Even if Jeff Bezos was like, I'll give every, I'll, I will create jobs and a hundred thousand dollars, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. I need ten, I need five hundred thousand people to come, to work, and I'll pay every single one of you a hundred thousand. How many things would show up? Probably not that many. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So don't look at it like the, the the guys that and girls that have created it are the bad people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just being honest and open here. You know how many people would show up? Election system. It's 2022. Yeah. And we're still electing by paper ballots with the risk of security and malfeasance. And not, not, paper, and not paper ballots. Electronic ballots. Electronic ballots. The risk ballots. of everything. Yeah. And you're a big cybersecurity guy, too. Oh, a huge cybersecurity guy. Yeah. Yeah. That was the most technologically advanced country in the history of the world. Still manages to not be perfect at it. Because there's people more perfect at us that don't want us to have that success. Mm. And that is the nature of the metaverse and the cyberspace. Those who have will always take away from those who almost have. And, you know, in our election system, right, you know, you should go back to paper ballots. You know, that's the best way to secure it. But then you have to have accountability. And that's what I tell people, we, with this voter integrity, we pass laws all the time that say you can't speed over 70 miles an hour on the freeway. I do it every day. I probably shouldn't say that, but I do. You know, I, I got a heavy foot. And unless there's a cop sitting there. <laughs> and then I won't. When it comes to election integrity and, and voter and voter um, voter art integrity, show up. People are less apt to break the rules if there is somebody standing there. You know, if you if you if you don't vote, then you can't complain. If you vote and you're not active, you're not at the polling. I've been at the polling sites every single day. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a candidate, but, you know, I'm there. And I tell people, hey, be a polling judge. Show up. It's only a day out of your life. And then you can watch everything that goes down. It's like, that's not, you're not supposed to be doing that. You know, you got to raise awareness. But if you don't, we won't. And Montgomery County actually has the uh, highest voter integrity, uh, I think, in the country. Most of, it is definitely in the state. You know, they should model what Montgomery County and Walker County look like. It's very, both sides, blue, blue and red. There are uh, judges and pre, uh, precinct chairs and judges and um, volunteers. Are, they're all in there. Everything, everything, there's harmony. Everything's great. But at one side, it's a checks and balance. And it's, it's very fluid. It's very systematic. And it works very well. I mean, but you, when you go into Harris County, and it, it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And since mm -hmm. people don't show up. What can the federal level do? to respect states' rights with their own voting laws. Stay away. Still, stay away entirely? Let states do it. Stay away. That's my job as a congressional member. Keep the, keep the federal government away from the states. Voting, education, let, let states handle it. <clears throat> federal government should not be involved in that. It, it, it has the ability to go so far in either direction in such a hurry, it, it would just be out of control. It would. I mean... Let's just speak hypothetical. You have an administration, a Senate, a House. 
majority, and you pass all the laws that only half the country want, and it affects every single state. How bad would that be? be terrible. Either direction. Either direction. That's, yeah, I just said that's why I just said administration. Either direction. How how terrible would that be? It belongs in the states. That's in our constitution. So federal responsibility is really focused on border control, national security. And oh yeah, Article Four, Section Four. I mean, you, they're supposed to protect us. Federal infrastructure, social programs. And be careful with social programs, but you know, there's some things the states can do very well that the government, you know, federal government should stay away from too. The, vets, the more lim, you know, not small but limited government. Federal government should be limited, not small. And limited in its ability and scope, and it's li- it's outlined in the Constitution. Every article, every section, and every amendment. And over the decades, we've just delegated authorities to places that it shouldn't be, where the congressional members. You know why we get? You know why you vote for a congressional member every two years? Because you can get them. If they screw up, you can get them. Because congressional members make the laws. They had that the Congress is the most powerful branch. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Those three branches that are equal, that's not the case at all. It's the Congress that's everything. That's why you can get to them every time. Our, our founding fathers knew that. Mm-hmm. And that's why they put that in place. The Supreme Court, the judicial system, they're supposed to enact the laws that are passed by the Congress. Now it's not open for interpretation of what they think and how they run want to run the country. That's not it at all. The Congress does that. We have a judge or a precinct somewhere in the country that's doing whole, Congress can get rid of them all together. Get rid of the whole thing. They have that power. But right now you have people in the, in, in the Congress that have been there for so long. They just, they've lost sight in my opinion. They just, they, they forget where our foundation comes from. Mm-hmm. Well, connectivity to their jurisdiction, their community. Yeah. Supreme court. Uh, the new justice pick. Okay, somebody said, I, who is it? I just heard on the radio on the way back here, Jackson. Uh, okay, I don't know who that is. Public defender, female public defender, uh, then attorney, and then judge. I'm not sure exactly where. Seem qualified? I, I haven't done any research on it. I knew he had three, I think, three three possibles. Three possibles. Yeah. I, I don't know anything about her, with the exception just heard her name on the radio on the way here. Yeah, I'll have to dig in and see what's going on. Better do it in a hurry. Come January. You think we should increase the no, size of the Supreme no, Court? No, You think we should decrease it? I think it's just fine the way it is. Leave it be. Just, it's, it's like that for a reason. It was increased in the 80s, right? I think increased one member in the 80s. I thought increased? it's always been nine. Hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. You probably know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, was uh, 1935. Roosevelt wanted to go to thir- go to 13. I think nine's fine. Leave it where it is. Call it good. You're for term limits. Absolutely. Uh, by law or by. Uh, so it'll never pass. So choice. term. So, so so there's some things we should have in the Constitution. We should have a balanced budget amendment. If we were one vote away from getting that. I think it was. I think it was in the late eighties, early nineties. I think one vote from a balanced bunch of amendment. You know how amazing that would be. Hmm. We're thirty trillion dollars in debt. <clears throat> thirty trillion, thirty trillion dollars. Google debt clock. Yeah. Have you guys seen that? Yep. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it, it has like thirty different things on it. I mean, we've been in here for an hour. The debt went up probably four hundred million dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Term limits and a balanced budget amendment will only be, in my opinion, it'll never get passed through through the through Congress. It'll have to be a convention of the states. Mm. And Article Five in the Constitution, which has never been enacted, but our forefathers put that in there for a very good reason because they knew way back then that one day we would need it. So, if a ma- three, if a majority of the states come, we need thirty-eight states to ratify the Constitution. And you could add a balanced budget amendment and term limits. And people are like, well, what's term, term limits look like for a Congress and a Senate? Well, I mean, two terms for the president. I've, I've said um, five terms for a congressional member, 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, you, 
it takes about 10 years to committee. And um, what was it? Uh, two terms for uh, Senate. 12 years. 12 years? Yeah. And then go back out and do what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's how it was intended. Mm-hmm. And I mean, 20 years in the military, you're out. Four year, or Two terms, eight years, and you're out. People just get in there and it ain't about money when you're in, I've seen it. It's not about money up there. It's, it's presence and power, positional authority. Mm-hmm. That's what they care about. Mm-hmm. Which is ego. It's ego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a shame. Which that's self-serving. It so is. You're not serving the people. You, you, can't, you can't tell me somebody up there that's been there for 40 years is 80 years old has the pulse on what's going on. It's actually district. going on. <laughs> it's actually going on in their district. Mm-hmm. You can't tell me that. Yeah. I wouldn't believe me if they tried. And that's Republican and Democrat. Mm-hmm. I'm not throwing stones at just one particular party. I'm saying you, you got no idea what that <laughs> those 20 year olds are talking about. Hell, I'm 40 and it's challenging. So anyway, between now and past the primary, what can we do to help out? Oh yeah. Thanks for asking. You know, it's now to the primary, which is in four, four days. Uh, if you haven't voted yet, do your homework on the candidates. I mean, dig in. Show up to one of these polling. If you're local, show up to these polling sites. If you're not, and, and like if you want to contribute or support in some way, go on, look up our, our congressional candidates and do your homework on every single one of us and figure out which, which one you align. And I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. I mean, I don't agree with 95% of the, or, or, or I don't agree with 50% of what you say, but the other 50, you seem like you're a viable candidate to represent because it's a, it's a red district. One of us is going mm-hmm. and then get out and vote. It, there's 767,000 people in my district, 25,000 to vote in the primary. You said 760,000 people in district eight, 767,000. Wow. 25,000 will get out and vote in the primary. If there's a runoff, it'd be about ten grand, and I think the number for the general election is probably around two hundred out of seven hundred thousand people. Why do you think there's always such a low voter turnout? I mean, this I is historic. You know, I just it's um. I, when I was in Afghan, when I was in Iraq one year down in um. Salter City, you guys remember that place? Mm-hmm. We were pulling in; they were having an election, and we came pulling in. Right around, they were having it at the police station. There was a graduation, and they were having an election. And some dude walked in there with an S vest and killed three hundred people. And we showed up about three and a half minutes. I mean, there's body parts all over the wall. I mean, it's just like looks like somebody just dumped out a grinder because they were voting. They, you have no idea how fortunate people don't understand how fortunate you are to have that right to vote. And it's a big deal. And every election, I and I, you know, I didn't do this either. When I was a kid or I was in the military, you know, I voted in the general election. I just didn't. I was like, who, whoever goes, goes. Well, look where we are now. Mm-hmm. And I'm, that's, I'm part of the problem. You know, I, I did it too. I'm trying to fix it. But I did, not, I did not focus in on my elected officials like I should have. I mean, call it a grid, just call it ignorance, call it whatever you want. But I just didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't, I was front side focused on my career or my kids or being a dumbass when I was, a, you know, just name it. I mean, mm-hmm. politics wasn't a thing, but it should be. It absolutely should be. People have this assumption that their vote doesn't matter. They're one. Oh, I've had so many matter. people tell me that. Yeah. What Tony, good is it? What good is it? Is it going to do? Right? Uh, well, I got a buddy of mine who won he three votes. He won by three votes, three votes. Mm-hmm. Tell me your vote doesn't count. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. You know, I went to your rally at here uh, on our cafe. Yeah, oh yeah, I appreciate and, uh, you coming out to that. I got to tell you, Morgan, I've never been to a rally before, ever. It was uh, my first one too. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good one to go to. <laughs> it was my first one. And too. Uh, you know, I silently go vote. I do my thing. I don't really talk about my political beliefs because I'm I'm not trying to change people's opinions. I love to learn, mm-hmm. um, but I have never felt more patriotic than being there that day. Oh, thank and the coolest awesome. thing, Morgan, was at this table uh, of several of these people that were there. And one lady said, um, just the turnout to support you made them go, this is what I'm voting for. Another couple 
uh, probably two seats away, I heard the wife look at the husband and goes, I don't know how to early vote, but let's go do it. So it was cool to see the sentiment of people that showed up, a lot of people that knew you and knew of you, mm -hmm. um, or just wanted to support the candidate. Uh, but it was really cool to be a part of something like that, especially in that space, which yeah. was humbling in, yeah, in and honor, of itself. Yeah, the Honor Cafe <laughs> in Conroe is yeah. it's just a really, it's a, it's a good representation. I mean, you had some really history. cool people come up and say some great things about you. R yeah. Governor Rick Perry. Governor Karen Perry. It, but you actually, you have some experience in D.C. already because you were a special advisor to him when he was the secretary of the Department of Energy, correct? I was, yeah, yeah. I, he brought me up there, uh, his senior advisor to him, to... One of the programs I started when I was in grad school was helping veterans and veteran veteran health care. And, it, and uh, they were like, hey, can you come up here and utilize the Department of Energy, which people like energy, to uh, scale up what you're doing to, to save and help veterans, help and save veterans. And I was like, sure, absolutely. So I came up there. So the Department of Energy, it's very eloquently mistitled. It should be called the Department of Everything. Mm. I mean, it, it touches every aspect of human existence inside our country and abroad. I mean, if the DOE was a shutdown, our country would shut down. It's one of those necessities, like mm. the DOD. Yeah. And we, this, this, yeah. So the, so the DOE, Department of Energy, cured Ebola when it hit our, when it hit our country. Mm. The lab, the researchers, the scientists, the doctors, and the, and the computers at the DOE cured Ebola. Wow. Yeah. No, nobody knows that. The, the, the DOE invented the artificial retina. The DOE maintains our nuclear arsenal. The DOE houses 17 national laboratories and all of our supercomputers. And Secretary Perry brought me up there, and he's like, hey, I want you to, to utilize the DOE to solve these problems of traumatic brain injury and cancer and opioid and suicide and all this kind of stuff. I was like, and suicides, we're doing computational analytics to see, okay, what is the trait that leads people to do that? Mm -hmm. You know, we run scenario-based algorithms off the computers. And I was like, sure, yeah, okay, I'm on my way. Uh, great experience. I learned a lot in DC, man, DC. I learned a lot there because uh, I had to stand up in office, get a budget, build a team, and where I had to work across the aisle. It was great. I was in the business of saving lives. So I did not Democrat. I, I was, I was, and I worked under President Trump, but I was, and I met with just as many on the blue side as I did on the red side. Because again, I was just like, hey, look, I'm here. To, I'm here to help solve ca cure cancer. Mm. You know, it, it, believe me, cancer's colorblind. Mm. So it's traumatic brain injury, you know, things like that. And they were like, yeah, how do we do this? So my, my job was to move data information and I created partnerships with institutes of public private institutes of science, technology, and medicine, you know, for over the, over the past decades, we've just come so brilliant in collecting data, like healthcare data, like two males, average age, height, you know, you got this mm -hmm. DNA structure, blah, 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 you know, really in, in imaging on the brain and all that kind of stuff. And the, and the, beautiful part about us, we have all this information that we can solve these problems, but the, the bad part about us is there is so much information that we can't compute it. There's just so much information. You don't know which piece of information or which piece of data to use to solve a problem because there's so much of it. So what we started doing, it was, it was actually a brilliant plan. Um, we actually started moving data sets. Let's just say, for instance, like on the brain, traumatic brain injury was my thing, right? So I started with traumatic brain injury. So we, um, we started moving data sets of the brain, healthy brains, hundreds of thousands of healthy brain images, depth, scope, durations, different kinds, right? And we put it in this enclave, this where we housed it. It's called enclave, all right? And we partnered with a traumatic brain ICU ward in California. So the doctor was sitting there with a, with a traumatic brain injury patient, and he would image that guy's, guy's or girl's brain. And he would shoot that imagery over to the laboratory where all those healthy brain pictures were housed. Okay. And the computer would take the damaged brain and compare it to all these hundreds of thousands of data points on this healthy brain. And in a matter of minutes would send it back to the neurologist and say, chances are the damage is here. This wow. is how deep it is. This is the scale and scope of it. You need to go to surgery right now. This is probably going to be the outcome. This will be the symptomatic issues they're faced with. Cool. This is the farming. That was what we did, wow. right? Never been done before. And normally in ICU, you get a scan. In a couple of days, it would come back. Mm -hmm. we, we brought it back in a couple of minutes. You think about that. So, like, if we if there was a little dock in a box right here, this is what we were trying to build up. There's a little dock in a box out here, and you walked in, and it's the, doctor's, you, the doctor gives you diagnostic workup. 
types it in the computer. And he's like, patient so-and-so has these many symptoms. It would sh- shoot it over to that, that place where we were storing all that information. In a matter of seconds, it would come back compared to trillions and trillions of doctor's notes across the gl- country. And you go 99.9%, you have the flu without even testing you. Right? Imagine that. Imagine how great that would be. If somebody in Montana, out in the middle of nowhere, had access to every single piece of information that the most brilliant scientists, doctors, neuroscientists, whatever, put together, if that lived and breathed, and that's what we were building. Uh, that's what he. That's what I went out there to do. Um, unfortunately, this this it's not there anymore. Wow! No it, kidding. It didn't. Yeah, it didn't. Uh, administration's flip. Just it, went down the water. It's a thing. It's a thing. Wow. Yeah. So it's out there floating around somewhere. It's just like a, a CPU terminal collecting dust. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's gone. Wow. Believe that? Mm-hmm. So, and that's in my second, I set up another office, uh, office of artificial intelligence. And our, our job was to, to um, you know, everybody talks about quantum computing and the quantum space and the singularities and all that kind of stuff. And we were doing cyber threat, cyber risks, assessments and whatnot, um, which is very applicable now considering what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and China. Mm-hmm. And it died too. Yeah, it's going. And just, um, it's funny when, you know, administrations flip, they're just like, if it wasn't our idea, it's, we got other ones and we'll fund something else. And it just. From a cyber perspective, where do you think uh, for average Joe Smith that they're, or even from a a company or a a country standpoint, what's the, uh, what's an area that people could either consider protecting from a cyber security level from a personal level and then from a, yeah. like an enterprise level. It's, it's, I, I don't differentiate between the two. Mm. I mean, you got, I mean, somebody takes your business just as bad as somebody takes your bank account or yeah. steals your identity. Mm. I mean, there's a lot worse things on life than dying. And when somebody ruins your credit, mm. takes, steals your identity, buys all kinds of stuff, you know, that, that hurts. Somebody yeah. malware, spyware, you know, stand, um, sandworm, they send that in and they scuttle your business, take all your stuff. You got to pay a ransom. Right now, the, the response to the federal government, when somebody gets hit with ransomware is like, pay it. You know, it shouldn't be that way. You just be very caught. And I, it's, I'm not trying to scare anybody. You know, it's, it's the space we live in. But be cautious, be careful. You know, you get on Facebook, get Instagram, whatever. You, 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 do, you, do you read the terms and conditions? No. You just click and go. And they're telling you on there right now, we're going we're gonna to sell your data. And every single piece of data point you put into that into that platform is open source. And I don't care if you secure it or not. If he's like, I want it to be private, it's not private. It lives and breathes on their servers. Mm-hmm. So if anybody hacks their servers, it's gone. And somebody else owns it. So just be cautious. I mean, especially with your banking, everybody does everything on their phone. You got the card on the phone. You got the driver's license on your phone. Everything lives and breathes on your phone. Just have t- t- you know, um, double authentication. Make sure that you, you know, everybody's like, oh, I got a password that I use. The same one of this, you know, you, you don't want the same password and everything. You want to change that thing every every six weeks, you know. Be just, just paranoid enough to know that don't think that it can't happen to you. Mm. Even, I mean, like even you guys here at Tune Up, I mean, don't think that somebody, they're not going to go after the grid. They're not going to go after some big entity that the government owns because those things are monitored and maintained by subject matter experts in cyber and cyberspace, cyber risk, cyber threat. You know, me and you sitting here talking right now, they come after us in a heartbeat and nobody ever sees it. Mm-hmm. Nobody's ever going to hear about it. Mm-hmm. And it, it's just how it is. So, and they, and you know, the, the threats that are coming from the nefarious actors across the pond, they know that. And they can make just as much money off of a thousand people than they can off one person that's a billionaire. So just be conscious, be aware. I, I met with the, you kids, especially. I mean, that goes from everything that they see, hear, and touch and smell on that phone. I was talking to uh, the district attorney in, in our, in our, in one of our counties and, Predators don't go after our babies anymore in the parks and in ball games and all that kind of stuff. They usually yeah. they, they go on the phones, TikTok and everything, gaming, fake accounts. They, they, yeah. they snatch them off the internet, yeah. you know, and they don't even have to touch them. Right. You know, they did. They start probing them. Like, oh, you know, they they had case studies they were showing us, and how innocent just boys and girls just they they just trapped them. And, you know, like hey, look, oh hey, you know, I saw you had a birthday party. Hey, send me some pictures. Oh, you look so great in your bathing suit. You know, they were doing that to them. And then the, vic- the, the victims would send pictures, and then the, the predator would go, I got you. And if you don't send me more, I'm, I'm going to tell your parents. You know, that's how they do it. And they do it all on that phone. Yeah. 
it's just it was terrible. It was horrible. I mean, it's sad. I've actually had talks with my kids about this. You should. You should. Mm-hmm. Like it, there's no untouched topic in our in my household. That's good. My kids aren't allowed to get on game. They don't have phones, game, nothing. They don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, you go outside and play. <laughs> Come in when the street light comes on. Yeah, street light. <laughs> uh, so when it comes to protecting yourself, just be aware. Don't be, don't be, don't be naive enough to say it's not going to happen to me. You know, that's famous. That's everybody's famous last words. I didn't think it would happen to me. Mm-hmm. You know, don't be a victim. Yeah, just be. A, check your accounts, social media or banking, or anytime you go on on the on the metaverse. Always do some follow up. Hey, did I actually do that? You know, just be. Yeah. Be involved. And with your kids, <laughs> especially, they can't regulate themselves. <laughs> no, they can't. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> I'm, uh, I got a kind of dent. Um, so at the, that's what I did at the Department of Energy, and I left actually left, left the DOE right at, right at two years, um, maybe a little under. Uh, went to the Harvard Business School, got my executive education out of the out of there, out of Boston. Those are leadership principles, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, great mm-hmm. course. You guys should look into those things. I don't know if you're like really want like get back into academic. You just well as much as you guys read, you guys totally dig that. <laughs> Harvard has a great program. Yale, uh, Wharton has some of those. It, they're executive programs for guys mm-hmm. that, that run that uh, run a business like you are. They don't have two years to just completely dedicate yourself. Mm-hmm. It's for business owners, and really, what you get out of it is you get the Harvard experience with the professors that are there, and they go over case studies of from Netflix to Blockbuster to and it was amazing yeah. what they what they covered. You just get so much perspective because your classmates are from. I had a, I had a um, 39 countries rec- uh, in my my class. My classmates were from 39 wow. different countries. Oh, yeah, it was great. Everywhere from the CEO at Tiffany's all the way down to uh, Walmart senior vice president, wow. you know, things like that. Yeah. Saudi Arabia, undersecretary of defense was in my class. So, And you just hear perspectives on things that they are doing, mm. and it really elevates you in a way that you're like, oh, okay, I didn't see that. But it's lifelong. So I reach out to my living group and my classmates and say, I'm, you know, I got something coming down the pipe here. I haven't seen this before. What do you think? And it's the network is amazing. Wow. Yeah. Well worth it. Well worth it. Yeah. So I left there, came home and started two companies. Uh, one of them is in a bio, is in, it's actually in the green space, biodegradable signage. Mm. I partnered with a company that had this mineral coating that when you spray it on cardboard, it makes it look, look, feel and smell like plastic, but it's not. You leave it outside for 90 days. It completely goes away. Mm. Yeah. It's remarkable. You hang it inside, it lasts forever, but <laughs> outside it, it degrades like it's supposed wow. to. And my other one is I install smart infrastructure, power over Ethernet, low voltage. You run everything off your phone, lights, computers. I noticed you looking at our, yeah. our lights and everything when oh, you yeah. came in. Oh, it's, my, it's a curse now, man. I just <laughs> like, oh, man, you guys need a reno job in a hurry. It can save you all kinds of money. It'd be great. He asked me, he goes, how long you guys been in here? He's looking at the lights. <laughs> yeah. 30 years. You got some old lights in here, man. Uh, that now, I'm, I'm an adjunct professor. Up until recently, adjunct professor at Sam. I taught uh, case studies over behavioral science, oh, trauma to law enforcement. Morgan, from a from a human level, how do you balance all that and have a family with your wife and your kids, your boys? Because I mean, your family is family centric. Sure, yeah, but absolutely. you've got a lot of irons in the fire. How do you balance? Yeah, that? No, I do. Um, I spend I, every waking minute that I have free with my boys. You know, we get up early in the morning before we go to school, two hours before we go to school. So I get I get to spend that time with them, and mm-hmm. they go to school, and I do everything I can while they're in school, and I'm there to pick them up. Mm. at the end of the day and then the campaign now that we're so close to the primary has been impactful to the family but we take them with us so now mm. they're they're out there with us and you know it was a family decision uh, to do this so the family's all in i had when i was working in dc i flew back and forth so they've been through this before mm. and, um, so they've been on deployment so they're used to it that's another another adventure <laughs> <laughs> but I cherish every single second. They're staying here in the district too. Really? I'm not taking them with me. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. They're staying right here. You know, my boys are sixth generation Texans. I, I think you heard me say that my, Leslie went into labor with Gunner when we were in Virginia. <laughs> yeah, I put her in the truck and drove her to Texas. <laughs> and he was born in Texas. Huge deal. You might have broke the speed limit on that. I, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, 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 I did. Not gonna lie. Morgan, where can people connect? Find you? Oh, let's see here. <laughs> Um, on Instagram, it's Mojo Latrell. Yeah, yeah, Mojo. I was like, it's like uh, Mojo Latrell is on my, my Instagram, and then MorganLatrell.com is my campaign. If you want to learn a little bit more about me and what I stand for, 
Well, thanks again for having me, guys. It's always it's always great to see you guys. Yeah. Good luck in the next few days. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for coming in, Morgan. We yeah. really do appreciate yeah, it. Pleasure. I'm humbled to be here. Yeah, brother. Well, guys, thank you for tuning in for this episode of uh, 100% Tilted Discussions with Winning Underdogs. This is definitely one American hero and underdog that is has got never has got no quit in him. Yeah. Absolutely. Guys, thanks for your support as always. Always free, but all we ask is that you share. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, stay tilted. Have a blessed day.